Okay, everybody, shall we make a start? Um, so I'm going to continue where we were last time, which was developing the canonical partition function for the ideal gas. Okay? And we didn't manage to do it all last time, so let me remind you where we got to. The first result is that I said for distinguishable particles, distinguishable non-interacting particles, with energy levels epsilon i, we showed that the partition function z is quite simple. It's a sum over the possible energy levels i of the Boltzmann factor to the power of the number of particles. Okay. So for the distinguishable non-interacting case is quite simple. Okay. But for indistinguishable particles, it's more complicated, and therefore we need to use an approximation. And what we argued last time is that for indistinguishable particles, if the temperature is high enough, then there are many more levels than there are particles. Okay? In this case, it's unlikely that more than one particle will be in any one level. And then there's a direct relationship between the two partition functions. So for indistinguishable particles, at high enough temperatures, the Z for the indistinguishable particles is approximately 1 over n factorial times Z for the distinguishable particles. So this was a result of the fact that if the temperature is high enough, then there will be at most one particle per level. And if there's one particle per level, then the number of rearrangements is just 1 over m factorial. Okay. So that's where it comes from. Okay. Now in this approximation, I told you that at typical pressures and volumes, this is good as long as temperature is a few Kelvin for a gas, for an ideal gas. So this is quite a good approximation. And this gives us, for the ideal gas, we have the Z, which is a function of temperature and volume of the gas, is a sum over nx, ny, and z, which go from minus infinity to infinity. Of e to the minus epsilon n over kVt. So the energy levels in a gas are labeled by some vector n, okay, which take integer values between minus infinity and infinity where epsilon n is a function of v. That's where the function of v here comes from. And was found to be 2 pi squared h bar squared over m times v to the minus 2 thirds times the length of the n vector squared. These are all results that we saw either last time or before that. So, so far I haven't done anything new. Okay, so in order to calculate this, we need to evaluate the sum, n goes from minus infinity to infinity, of this thing, which looks like e to the minus constant times n squared. Okay? Now, this sum you can't do exactly. The sum e to the minus n squared you can't do exactly, and therefore we're going to use an approximation.
see this one. e to the minus some constant times n squared. That's the kind of sum we've got. But you can't do it exactly. So we will use an approximation. Okay. And the approximation we'll use is one which is going to be very useful throughout the whole of statistical physics. So if you take this course next semester, we'll use it a lot then as well. It's called the density of states approximation. What we want to do in general is a sum of some function of energy over some certain energy levels. Okay? So we want to calculate a sum which looks like a sum over certain energy levels i of some function of the energies epsilon i. For some, i is just a label of index of energy levels. So in the case of an ideal gas, it's actually a vector of integers. But that doesn't matter. All it is is some label for all of the different energy levels in the gas. And that's exactly the kind of sum that we want to do here. right? We're summing over a certain energy levels of e to the minus energy divided by kBT. This is some function of energy. So this is what we want to calculate. Okay. Now, what does this look like then? If I draw it as a graph of the function f of epsilon against epsilon, suppose that this function looks like this, something, I don't know. Okay. In fact, it's an exponential decay, so it doesn't look like this, but this is just to give you an idea. Then, there are certain energy levels here, epsilon 0, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, and so on epsilon 4. And for each of these energy levels, I take the value of the function and I add it up. So what you do is, in this sum, you take the values of the function at each of these points and you add them all up. Now, hopefully, this should remind you of the picture of what you do when you calculate an integral. So, let me compare this to you now. Compare with the definition of integral. If I try and integrate the function between 0 and some upper bound epsilon, then this is defined as the limit of a sum delta epsilon times the sum i goes from 0 to epsilon over delta epsilon of f of i delta epsilon. Okay. So if I draw that picture for you now, what you do in the integral is you take evenly spaced chunks like this, and you add them all up, right? Where the width here is delta epsilon. And you basically approximate the integral by the area of all of these rectangles here. Okay. 
Right, so I'm sure you've seen this before, right? So the idea is we're going to relate this sum, which is a sum like this, to an integral, which you can define as a sum like this, and the limit that the width between states is very small. So we're going to relate this sum to some kind of integral. This is the idea of the density of states approximation. You can know that the important difference between these two cases is that here the width is fixed. Right? In the definition of the integral, the width delta epsilon is fixed. Whereas here, the distance between energy levels varies. So that's something we have to take into account. Okay? Secondly, this is a good approximation provided that f changes slowly over one rectangle, over width the delta epsilon. So this is good if f of epsilon changes slowly over the width delta epsilon. So, let me draw you a picture to show you what I mean by that. So, I'll draw two different functions of f. f1 of epsilon. 2 epsilon. So I can take an, a function which looks something like this. Well, okay, that's, that's too boring. <laughs> function which looks something like this. Or I can take a function which looks something like this. Okay. Now in the first case, the sum is a good approximation to the integral, because the sum looks like this. Okay. And you can see that the area of the rectangles is virtually the same as the area under the curve. So in this case, it's a good approximation. Whereas in this case, the sum is a very bad approximation to the integral. because the area of the rectangles is very different from the area under the curve. So this is why I say that f has to change slowly. If s changes fast over the width delta epsilon, then you can miss some of the important changes in the function f, and therefore you'll get errors. Okay. So, in order to rewrite the sum as an integral, it's important that the, in, the value of the function f does not change significantly in between energy levels. Right. So this is what we, we hope we can find. So suppose we can find an energy scale delta epsilon such that Firstly, this is true. So firstly, it's good enough to give you an integral, well, an approximation to the integral. So f of epsilon changes slowly over delta epsilon. Okay, and I should say, sorry, this is a bad approximation, right? So firstly, we want to find a scale where the change of f is slow over that scale. And secondly, we want to find a scale such that there are many energy levels within a particular width. Okay. Okay. 
So I want these two conditions to be true. Firstly, this width is such that the function f changes slowly. And secondly, within this width, within this width delta epsilon, there are many energy levels. Then in this case, we can approximate the sum over energy levels with an integral. So we can define this as a function. We set the number of energy levels um, okay. between, between epsilon and epsilon plus, del epsilon plus delta. as some function which depends upon epsilon times delta epsilon. If I draw this again as a graph, here's my width delta epsilon. I'll draw it bigger now so you can see it. And we suppose that within this width, we have many energy levels. Okay. So these red things here are energy levels. So, for example, in here, as I've drawn it, there are seven, six, six energy levels within a particular width delta epsilon. Here and here. Now, this function rho of epsilon is called the density of state, and it's what gives this approximation its name. Then, we can say the following is true. The original sum that we wanted to do is approximately equal to an integral of the function f, except that instead of just taking one sample per width delta epsilon, we take many samples, because we take one value for each of the energy levels. So therefore, we have to multiply by the number of energy levels, which is just rho of epsilon. Okay. So if we just take one sample per width delta epsilon, we just get an integral of f. But if I take many samples over a width delta epsilon, then I'm about to multiply f by the number of samples I take, okay, which is this. Okay, so this, this is the result, and this is called the density of states approximation, and as I said, it's, it's quite important, and we will use it frequently for the rest of the course. So in order to use this approximation, we have to calculate what is this function rho, so what is the density of states for the ideal gas, so that's what I'll do next. So density of states for an ideal gas. So just to remind you again, epsilon n was 2 pi squared h bar squared over m times v to the minus 2 thirds times n squared Okay. Where 
the vector n is a vector of integers in three dimensions, nx, and y, and nz. So I can draw this, I'll draw only two dimensions, because otherwise it gets too complicated. But we can draw all of these vectors in two dimensions. I'll take nx going this way, and then y going this way. Then we get a level when both of them are equal to zero. We get a level when one of them is zero and one of them is plus or minus one. This is one minus one minus one. And so on. Okay, so they fill up the space as a regular square grid. Okay, so in three dimensions, it will be a regular cubic grid. So, okay, so each of these blue dots is a given level for the ideal gas, for a particle within the ideal gas. Now the energy just depends upon the length of the vector n, right? The energy just depends upon n as the length of the vector. So Vectors with a shorter length in here have less energy, and vectors with a larger length have more energy. So what I need to calculate is how many levels are there between two particular values of energy. So for the first value of energy, epsilon, let's say that is somewhere here. It defines a circle, right? All of the states with a fixed value of energy define a circle like this. So I can call this distance R of epsilon. Okay, we can work out what R of epsilon is for this formula. R of epsilon is the length of all the vectors which have energy less than epsilon. So from this formula we get that R squared is equal to Okay, no. let me do it slowly. We get that epsilon is equal to 2 pi squared h bar squared over m b to the minus 2 thirds times the radius, the length of the vector r squared. So this means, if you rearrange it, that r of epsilon is, well, I can write it this way, 2m to the power of a half divided by 2 pi squared h bar squared b to 2 thirds times b to the power of a third times the square root of epsilon. So I've just rearranged this. So all of the vectors which have energy epsilon will have a length equal to this. Okay. So therefore they will fall on this circle in the diagram I've just drawn. Now for the density of states, what we need to know is how many states are there, how many levels are there between two close values of epsilon. So I take one at R of epsilon and then I take another circle at a slightly larger radius, like this. So this radius here is R of epsilon plus delta epsilon. And I need to count how many states are within this spherical shell. So the number of states with energy less than epsilon, this is the same 
as the number of states with the length of n less than the radius r. So that means counting the states within, within this circle, the number of states within this circle. But each of these states occupies a volume of 1, right? Because this is 0, 1, 2 in both directions. So each of these states occupies a volume of 1. So therefore, the number of states is approximately equal to the, the volume of the sphere. So this is approximately equal to the volume of the sphere. of radius r. Okay, and this is again a good approximation if r is big. We'll show later that r is big in the case of the gas. If r is large, then the number of states is approximately the same as the volume of the sphere. And you know that the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay, and r is a function of epsilon. So the number of states is approximately given by this, where r is given by this function here. So therefore, the number of states between epsilon and epsilon plus delta epsilon, this is the thing we actually want to calculate, this is the density of states, this must be equal to the difference in the volumes of spheres of radius r plus epsilon and radius r. So this is approximately equal to 4 thirds pi r epsilon plus delta epsilon cubed minus 4 thirds pi r epsilon cubed. And we've already defined the number of states between these energy values as equal to the density of states times delta epsilon. Right? So this must be equal to the density of states rho of epsilon times delta epsilon. But you can see that this is just a derivative, right? The definition of a derivative is function at, well, x plus delta x minus the function at x divided by delta x. Sorry, this is delta epsilon, not delta or epsilon. This. So therefore, rho is just a derivative of this function here. So the density of states is just d by d epsilon of 4 thirds pi r epsilon. If I just divide both of these by delta epsilon, here I get a derivative, which is this, and here I just get rho of epsilon. Okay, so this is what we have to calculate, and I've written the formula for r of epsilon over there, so let's just do this. This is d by d epsilon of 4 thirds pi times r cubed, so we get 2m to the 3 over 2 divided by nah. Sorry. Going back over here, I've made a mistake, right? Going from here to here, I must take a square root. So pi squared h bar squared should just become pi h bar. Right? Going from here to here, I've taken a square root, so the squares must go away. Right, okay. So then it should work. So now on the bottom, I have 2 pi h bar squared, h bar cubed, sorry. times v times epsilon to the three halves. Okay. 
Okay, and if I differentiate epsilon to the three halves, that gives me three halves times epsilon to the half. So this is three halves multiplied in here gives me just two. So this is two pi two m to the three over two divided by two pi h bar cubed times v times epsilon to the half. And we can simplify this, cancel some pi's and so on, and we get the final result. Rho of epsilon is 2m to the 3 over 2 divided by 4 pi squared h bar cubed times the volume times epsilon to the half. So this is the formula for density of states for an ideal gas. Finally, we have to check that the density of states approximation is valid. That means we have to check that over the width for which the function f changes, there are many, many energy levels. Okay. So for the ideal gas, The function we want to use in the density of states approximation is just the Boltzmann factor, which is e to the minus epsilon over kBt. Okay. And this function changes with a characteristic width of kBt. So f changes significantly. on the scale of kVt. And I'm going to work with the ideal gas at standard pressures and temperatures and so on. So if we evaluate this at 300 Kelvin, then this turns out to be a scale of about 4 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. So in order for the density of states approximation to be valid, we need that there, the distance between energy levels should be much, much less than this. So let's check that this is the case. Okay, let's check that there are many energy levels within an energy scale like this. We can do this in the following way. The average value of energy is just equal to the total energy of the system divided by the number of particles. Right? And for an ideal monatomic gas, this is 3 halves n kBt divided by n. Okay, ends cancel. So you get the average energy per particle is about 6 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. So now you can work out what is the density of states at this average value of energy. This is how many states per unit energy, right? This is the number of levels per joule. Okay. So in order to calculate this, we have to make some assumption about the volume, right? Because the density of states depends upon the volume and the mass. So, for example, if I take mass as being the mass of helium, helium is a good example of an ideal monatomic gas, and I'll take the volume as being one meter cubed, which is a reasonable size of a gas. Then, if you do the calculation, you calculate this thing, you find that the density of states is 2 times 10 to the 51 
Okay. So this means that there are 2 times 10 to the 51 levels per joule, which means the average width between levels is 1 over this. So therefore, the average delta epsilon between levels is 1 over the density, which is about 2 times 4 times 10 to the minus 52 joules. Okay. And you see that this is much, much less than the characteristic scale over which the function changes. Okay? The characteristic function scale over which the function changes is 4 times 10 to the minus 21 joules, but the average width between energy levels is 4 times 10 to the minus 52 joules. So there are many, many energy levels over the scale for which the function changes. So that means our approximation is valid. 4 times 10 to the minus 52 is much, much smaller than 4 times 10 to the minus 21. So therefore, there are many levels in the width delta epsilon over which F changes significantly. Okay. And therefore, the density of states approximation is good. So today I've introduced what the density of states approximation is, we've calculated the density of states for the case of the ideal gas, and finally I've proved that for an ideal gas at room temperatures and reasonable size volumes, this is a very good approximation. So we can make use of this approximation. So finally, to finish, I'll write down the equation which we will solve next time. Okay. So therefore, For the ideal, ideal monatomic gas, Z, we said at the start of this class, was 1 over n factorial times the sum nx, sum ny, sum nz of e to the minus epsilon n over kvt to the n. We can now use the density of states approximation, okay, which in general I will abbreviate to DOS approximation. So that enables us to replace this sum with an integral over the density of states. So this becomes 1 over n factorial times the integral from 0 to infinity of the density of states rho of epsilon, which we've calculated times the function, which is this. The power n. And then finally, if I put in the formula that we've worked out for the density of states, this is 1 over n factorial times, let's take all the constants outside, 2m, 3 over 2b over 4 pi squared h bar cubed times the integral from 0 to infinity of epsilon to the half e to the minus epsilon over kbt, all of this to the power n. Okay, so it's a bit of a beast of an equation, but we will simplify this next time, and we will show that this 
from this equation, we can derive all of the properties of the ideal gas. 